Hey, Jenny Moore, Dr. Roy, please take it away. Thank you, Dr. Goswami. Uh, I hope you can see my slides, right? All good. Okay. So today I'll be talking about renal emergencies as they present the accident and emergency department, a not too uncommon situation. So the areas I would like to focus on today is one, AKI, two, complications in hemodialysis, and third is complications in peritoneal dialysis. I was hoping to make this interactive. So uh, when we have questions, I'd be very happy if someone would uh, try and answer. And if they can't, then if I don't see anyone answering, then unfortunately, I will be choosing from among the list out there. That's fair, I guess, right? So, so, for, <laughs> right. so uh, we first start with acute kidney injury, something which is not uncommon in the a &E. And so I'll uh, pick up cases which we have from our Changi a &E. So uh, this is a 33-year-old uh, Indian male who presented just a couple of months ago with an instemi was hemodynamically stable, underwent a PCI the same day, 24 hours later was noted to have oliguria. His creatinine at the start was about 80 and subsequently no urine and the creatinine was 254. These are the numbers as you can see them. Um, and so the question is, what does he have? Is it pre-renal failure? obstructive uropathy or contrast-induced nephropathy. Anyone wants to have a go? Uh, hi, Dr. Roy. I think I can try. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, based on what's available information, uh, I cannot exactly see whether it's free or obstructive, but most likely it's uh, contrast-induced. Okay, so uh, why do you say it is contrast induced? So uh, he just underwent a, a, a PCI, which is a high dose of contrast, uh, although uh, prior to that, he's uh, got a paranormal you know, function. Right, right. So classically, contrast induced nephropathy occurs within 48 to 72 hours after exposure to a contrast, right? Okay, this is an even more interesting interesting patient who came up sometime last month. A 38-year-old Indonesian sailor presented to the recess for fever, cough, and bleeding from his nose and gums. Uh, he denies uh, hemoptysis. He denies PR bleeding. As you can see, his blood pressure at entry was 197 by 112. Saturation was 92%. And uh, uh, this is with no offense meant to the any opinion, but I'm, I'm just reading it for you. Uh, the impression was uh, likely pneumonia to rule out COVID. And uh, it was newly diagnosed hypertension to rule out uh, hypertensive emergency. Uh, and the final impression was anemia likely to secondary bleeding precipitated by thrombocytopenia. So here are your numbers. Uh, as you can see, young male, urea 60.3, creatinine only about 2,600, and the potassium is seven and the bicarb is 10. The first question, is this an AKI or a CKD? Right, anyone likes to have a go? Uh, hi, Dr. Roy. Um, so, I mean, he, I wasn't, I didn't manage to look at the past medical history, but given the acuity of his uh, presentation, I would say this is probably an AKI. And uh, we don't have a baseline creatinine function, but barring that, uh, it seems like possibly it's an AKI from his presentation. So if you had to differentiate an AKI from a CKD in the a &E, how would you do it? 
Um, so firstly, we would look through whether he's got any previous records or try to get a patient's um, history if he's a foreigner and doesn't have any previous records in, uh, in the ED um, or on any HR. <clears throat> but if there are records uh, available, usually we would look at their baseline creatinine as well as baseline EGFR and then work from there. Sure. So, so this is history, but if the history is absent. So it in the episode... Yeah, it's often the case in uh, Singapore. Remember, we are a major travel hub. So there'll be a lot of foreigners coming through where you don't have a history. So I think based on the clinical presentation, um, his uh, cause of, I mean, from the history of his current presenting illness itself, uh, it seems like it's probably an acute kidney injury rather than chronic. Lah. I mean, he's not seen to have any long-term diet. I guess, uh, vascular access or any peritoneal diseases, which we can see from the clinical examination as well. So that, I, I suppose, points us more towards uh, AKI. Also, I suppose um, uh, the CRED level is uh, uh, really high, and I suspect that the bleeding may be due to uh, uremia. Um, uh, we'll come to the bleeding. Yeah, we'll come to, to the bleeding. That. Okay. Yeah, so, but I, I guess on the clinical picture, it seems like acute kidney injury based on... Fair case. enough. Anyone else... Uh, can give us an objective way of differentiating AKI from CKD in the absence of history. Sorry, uh, like I think one of the more reliable indicators of CKD is that like small kidney or ultrasound. So if in the VSAS or ED, you can try uh, like focus and see whether the kidney size, I mean, if it's a small kidney, it's quite suggestive of a chronic kidney disease rather than an acute kidney injury. Uh, that's an excellent answer. But what is small? What is small? Uh, small has to have well, a definition. I think 11 to 13 cm is the normal size of a kidney. But I think grossly in ED, you will just be by visual estimates. <laughs> or so like you, the renal you, contact should be at least 2 cm for. So yeah. if you see a, a typical auntie who's 35 kilos and 4 feet in height, 11 centimeters. Is pushing it right. So yeah, sorry, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, the other thing we look at ultrasound is see it, compared to the liver, is it uh, more hyperechoic? Like, is it more white compared to the liver? If it's whiter, we think that it's more of CKD. While it should be more uh, less hypoechoic compared to the liver. That is also not entirely true. So the truth is, uh. Echogenic small kidney. In an AKI, you can have increased echogenicity, but an echogenic contracted kidney uh, is a synchronon for chronic kidney disease. And because we are Asian, so whoever said 11 to 13 is not wrong, but that is Caucasian literature. We deal with Asians. So for us, our cutoff would be 8.5 centimeters. Anything below 8.5 centimeters is truly small. Otherwise, you need to have previous ultrasounds. Any blood test which will help you differentiate an AKI from a CKD? Hi, Dr. Roy. Just wondering whether the drop levels help to differentiate. I think the rise would be greater in an AKI versus a CKD. But I'm not sure what the cutoff number would be. Uh, that's not true. Because uh, I know your rule in rule out is about 400, right? Uh, oh, no, I, I'm talking of the BNP. The TROPS, the TROPS will not help you. Okay. So the other thing which you can use is a PTH. A PTH more than two and a half times of normal. Normal for Changi is about seven. For singles is about seven. So anything above two and a half times would definitely suggest that this patient has a chronic kidney disease, right? So to repeat... To differentiate an AKI from a CKD, either I need to have a history where the creatinine was elevated three months prior, or I have to have a contracted echogenic kidney and or an elevated PTH. So the story of this patient gets more interesting. Uh, uh, dengue was looked for. Dengue is negative. Someone thought about post-streptococcal GM, given that he had uh, 
severe renal failure, hypertension, and this was negative as well. And you can see these uh, findings here. Anyone would like to have a go uh, at what is abnormal here? Can you see it? Now, can you just identify for me what the abnormalities you're seeing is? Uh, hi, Dr. Rai. So I think, sorry, the image is a little bit blur on my screen, but um, oh, okay. from what I can tell, there's uh, quite significant anemia with a low HP of 6. Point, I don't know, 6.6. 6.6, 6. 6. 6. 6. 6. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, there's thrombocytopenia as well. I, I can't really see the number, but it looks low. Like 62. 82, 82. 62. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then uh, there's a slight elevation in his uh, white counts as well. Uh, right. But that's just very light. Uh, so in terms of the electrolytes, um, oh, okay, uh, earlier on, I guess we had the renal panel, but here um, it seems to be hypocalcemic uh, with uh, hyperphosphatemia as well. And uh, the lactate is very, uh, the lactate is normal. So that, sorry, that was ferritin. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, the, pro the total protein level is also low. Uh, transferring is also low. Yeah. So let's re-put it together. A person with an acute kidney injury, hypertension, severe anemia, low platelets. What are you thinking? This is a medical emergency. So I, I think Patrick wrote something in the chat uh, of a possible HUS. Excellent. Excellent. So what we did further was an LDH, which was elevated. We did a peripheral smear, which showed schistocytes. Please remember, in any AKI, with a sudden drop in hemoglobin and a drop in platelets, there is underlying microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. You can see here the haptoglobins are very low. You have to have a consideration of HUS TTP. Right? And the typical pentad of TTP where the patient is drowsy need not be there. I went on to biopsy this patient subsequently and he had hypertensive nephrosclerosis and all of these features were a part of his hypertensive emergency. So what I'm trying to say is all AKIs are not simply because of diarrhea or uh, blood loss. There are a lot of other possibilities for AKI. So what is AKI? AKI is a rise in creatinine of 1.5 to 1.9 times baseline or an elevated of 26.5 millimoles per liter over the baseline or. So there is a creatinine criteria and there is a urine output criteria. It's not and, it's or. There is a urine output of less than 0.5 mil per kilo for six to 12 hours. This is for 12 hours. This is for more than 24 hours. And this is how the KDGO goes, one, two, three, divided into an increase of 1.5, an increase of two, and an increase of more than three times of baseline. Why do you care? In a patient with AKI who's KDGO3, the likelihood of his needing dialysis is very important. So when you see a patient in the a &E, what we would hope you would do is first assess the volume status, whether you do it clinically or you do it using ultrasound where you're looking at the IBC collapsibility, we have to assess the volume status. And what is most important is to differentiate the pre-renal from the post-renal. The pre-renal is usually due to decreased blood flow. It could be due to simple thing like diarrhea, blood loss, heart failure, it could be due to a variety of drugs which can cause an imbalance of the vasodilators and constrictors. Post-renal, very common in our elderly population, which we see this end of Singapore, is an enlarged 
prostate. You can pick this up very quickly on a bladder scan. Please remember a CT scan is a lousy way of picking up obstructive uropathy. Your ultrasound is vastly superior to using a CT scan, right? Now, the problem, uh, as we see both in the a &E and in the wards is the typical physician vacillates between trying to keep the patient dry, like someone here in the desert who's dying for fluid, or gives him so much fluid that he drowns the patient. So we need to get it exactly right. So what is right? So we have this patient, I know you can't read it up there, but I'll read you the uh, numbers. The urea is 10.8, the creatinine is 294. It was initially normal. Potassium is 5.4. If on clinical examination, you thought he was dehydrated, which fluid would you give? I give you a choice of these four. Anyone wants to have a go? There's no right, no wrong. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. If we, are, if we don't know, we will find out what we should do. Hi, Dr. Roy. Uh, yes. Serial here. Um, so I think uh, this guy has a, quite a borderline, 5.4 high potassium as well. The sodium is high. So I'll avoid uh, normal saline and uh, plasma. So I'll, I'll try giving him a Hartman's. Uh, your reason for giving Hartman's, sorry, was? So I, I'll read this out because it's difficult for you to see. The sodium is 130, potassium is 5.4, bicarb is 17, and the creatinine is 294. Yeah. So you want to give him uh, Hartman's, right? Hartman's. Uh, oh, I guess normal saline. Sorry, the saline is 130. So uh, sodium is 130. So normal saline should be fine as well. You want to give him normal saline. Okay. Anyone else has any other opinion on which fluid they'd want to give? Oh, I think I'll consider Hartman's actually for this patient. Yeah. Uh, you're not worried that his potassium is 5.4? Uh, I mean, of course, I'm worried and I would like to treat accordingly, um, if seeing where the ECG. But I think based on a lot of the trials of crystalloid versus normal saline, actually, uh, balanced crystalloid is usually the way to go. And normal saline usually causes a lot more acidosis uh, and then subsequently hyperkalemia compared to like, a balanced crystalloid. So, yeah, usually for such cases, especially with this Kidigo 3 or uh, AKI, I think a balanced crystalloid would be a better choice. Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, so one individual wants to give normal saline, which is okay. Another one wants to give Hartman's. Let us assume that you are unsure about his fluid status. How much fluid will you challenge him with? I give you three choices. So all of you are aware of the old river study, which was, you know, uh, goal-directed therapy, uh, right? So where they were talking about anything between four and six liters over the next six hours. So which, which uh, so we've decided on the fluid. Now the question is, how much of fluid would you give in the a &E? And we are sure this patient doesn't have ESRD, right? So that's my disclaimer. Is an AKI. Mm. Okay, <laughs> you have to decide, right? I suppose we can start with a small bolus of two, 20, I mean, given the options here, uh, 20 mils per kilo uh, body weight. Uh, but I guess to assess uh, fluid po potential fluid responsiveness in a patient in whom I'm unsure about the fluid status can do a bit side passive leg raise to see um, to gauge uh, his uh, hemodynamic response to a possible fluid bolus la. Yeah. So, so we are giving sorry can I just clarify we are giving the fluid for the AKI itself and he's otherwise hemodynamically stable or yes he's hemodynamically stable and you're giving fluids because you think he's mildly dehydrated you're not too sure but you think he's mildly dehydrated I, uh, I see in that case we can start with I would I would start with uh, 20 mils per kilo body weight. Yeah. Okay, I was very interested in your straight leg test. Uh, uh, your straight leg raise will do what? Sorry, so uh, usually, I mean, that, that will be in the context of a 
possible, possibly a bit borderline BP, or if the patient was uh, had a bit of a low had had hypotension, and if I were unsure about the cause of the hypotension or the patient's fluid status, then we can do a passive leg raise to see if the blood pressure would Im improve. But I guess in this case, if he's hemodynamically stable, then um, that is not really the cons considerations that I would take, lah. Okay, okay. So uh, basically, when we, whenever we talk about volume resuscitation in the critically ill, so this patient wasn't critically ill, but in the critically ill, the, uh, the reason why we're interested is whenever they are septic, there is decreased myocardial contractility, increased permeability, venous dilatation, all of this results in a decreased effective circulatory volume there's activation of the sympathetic pathway, renal vasoconstriction, and obviously it will end up in developing uh, acute tubular injury. Now, please remember, in all patients with AKI, we tend to be in one of these three situations, and it can go from one to the other. So the first is hypovolemia, which is what we were discussing just now, and most of the studies, and we'll discuss it in a little while, would suggest that buffered crystalloids would be the way to go, which is your typical balanced solution like plasma light or uh, use of something like Hartmann's ringer lactate. Uh, this would be preferred over uh, what they like calling normal saline, right? There's nothing normal about normal saline except the name itself. Then you can uh, you would hopefully bring the patient into a state of euvolemia. And if you have pushed him into hypervolemia or in a state of euvolemia and you don't have adequate urine output, you would consider using a diuretic. So uh, I would hope that that's what you would do in the a &E. So if you had to give this man frusamide, how much of frusamide would you give? And what are you looking for? This is a non-ESRD. So usually, I mean, that's uh, described in the LASIK, like Fusamide stress test, usually it's a 1 mg per kg. I think just now I saw the weight was about 70 kg. La. So we'll probably give about like LASIK 60 mg once. And basically, we're looking at um, like whether the kidney um, is still awake, <laughs> like alive or dead, la, kind of. Like see the urine output after that. I do need to look at the uh, urine output uh, of like 100 to 200 mils for the next two hours. If it's present, it suggests that, you know, the kidney is still functioning and you can consider giving more fluid. Of course, we uh, examining the fluid status of the patient and the hemodynamics. But otherwise, if it fails as a uh, stress test, we will consider um, early uh, RRT, uh, renal replacement that's, therapy. That's absolutely right. So basically, about 30% of your patients with ATN or AKI would be non-oliguric AKI. And this can be picked up based on the frusamide stress test. So in a patient who's frusamide naive, I would give one mg per kilo. And if he has had frusamide in the past, typically like your patients with uh, pre-existing heart failure, then I would use 1.5 milligrams to two milligrams per kilo. What we expect to see in the next two hours is 200 ml of urine. If that is not produced, obviously using prusamide is not going to be of much use. And these patients would most likely go on to requiring kidney replacement therapy, right? Now, the story of crystalloids versus balanced solution. So this is the SALT EM trial, which was basically uh, looking at a group of patients who were in the emergency department. And then there was the SMART study, which was basically in the intensive care. All of these studies basically had a primary outcome, which was survival or major adverse kidney events. Both the SALT ED study and the SMART study showed no difference in survival or major adverse events in these patients, either in the ED or ICU, who were given saline versus balanced solutions. 
Now, this is a study from Australia, New Zealand, where they looked at a bunch of patients with acute kidney injury in the ICU. This is known as a split study, and they used buffered crystalloids versus saline, but they found it did not reduce the risk of AKI. And this is the international guidelines for the management of severe sepsis in shock. I am aware that it is from 2012 and your sepsis bundle of 2016 doesn't talk about any of these things except it states that you need to give fluids at 30 mils per kilo over one hour. But please remember that is for a patient who is non-ESRD. In a patient who is ESRD, these rules don't hold true. And I would basically give 10 ml per kilo body weight of fluid in a half an hour, reassess, give another uh, 10 ml per kilo body weight and go in aliquots of 500 ml rather than go straight for 30 ml per kilo uh, in an ESRD because that might push your patient straight into the ICU with pulmonary edema. Right, now, as far as fluid resuscitation is concerned, the NICE guidelines suggest crystalloids are better than colloids that we know already. Now, most experts would recommend a balanced crystalloid, either Hartman's or plasma light, because excessive amount of uh, sodium chloride can cause uh, hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, the only exception being in a patient with known hyperkalemia. So uh, let's, let's look at this diagram here. Uh, on the left is the normal human plasma. And whenever we are giving a replacement solution, that's what we're trying to get. So what's your normal osmolarity in health? 280 to 290. What's most of yours favorite uh, replacement? what you like calling normal saline. As I said, there's nothing normal about normal saline because its osmolarity is 308. That's a lot more than what is, uh, what is our osmolarity in health. The other thing is, if you look at the sodium, the human plasma has a sodium of about 140. Normal saline is 154, way higher. Our normal chloride is about 100, 110. Normal saline is 154, way higher. So the solutions which seem to be the closest approximation to our plasma is either plasma light or Hartmann's ringer lactate, right? Now, for those of you who have the misplaced fear of potassium content in HRL or plasma light, please remember, when you measure serum potassium, what are you measuring? You're measuring the potassium in the extracellular fluid, right? So whenever we look at a human being, the total body water is 60% of the body weight. It's divided into the ECF and ICF. The ICF has about 3,300 milliclins of potassium and the ECF only has about 200 milliclins, right? So if you take a typical 70 kilo man, then the ECF will have 14 liters and the ICF will be 28 liters. Let's assume your potassium of your patient is 5.8 millimoles per liter when you see him and his weight is 70 kilos. You infuse two liters of plasma light. You know, it has five millimoles per liter, right? So what are we going to end up with? The patient serum will be 14 into 5.8 plus two into five divided by 16 liters. End result is 5.7 millimoles per liter. So you ended up at a lower potassium than where you started from. So I wouldn't be fearful of using Hartman's or plasma light as my solution for replacement unless the patient's potassium was well above six, right? <clears throat> so that brings us to the next question. Why does normal saline cause acidosis? 
Who would like to have a go? I think it's a high chloride content from the normal saline causing a uh, necma uh, while the acidosis. Why should high chloride cause uh, necma? Chloride is not an acid, so, right? Yeah. Basically, like excessive chloride load converts into the HCl. Then after that, uh, yeah, it causes the as an in, increase in the acidosis. This. Uh, yeah. As in the, the chloride uh, turns into like uh, a HCl. That, that's your belief, is it? Okay. Uh, I think when there's a high chloride load, the body excretes more bicarb. So in that, in that sense, you get the necma and thus uh, acidosis. That's partially true. Okay, let's look at this. So uh, you can see uh, on your left, right? You know our law of energy? Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It just changes from one form to the other, right? Law of conservation of energy. So since none of us produce electricity, uh, the anions and cations have to be balanced in health. So if you look at the left column, so, so the cations are sodium and potassium, and the major anion is chloride bicarbonate, and then there's the anion gap to balance this out. And that has phosphates, sulfates, albumin, and a lot of substances which are not measured. Imagine infusing a person with a solution which is rich in chloride. So for this to be maintained, for the electroneutrality to be maintained, what is going to happen is the bicarb is going to decrease. And hence, this is called hyperchloremic acidosis, right? So this, this is clear to you. This is what is called a gamble gram. And this is how you would de describe why normal saline or any solution which is high in chloride would cause metabolic acidosis. And this is a normal anion gap acidosis, right? Now, I say that normal saline can worsen hyperkalemia in a patient who is already hyperkalemic. Would one of you want to describe how? Because there is no potassium in normal cell life. So this is typically seen in kidney transplant patients where when they have been transplanted in the, uh, uh, basically in the operation theater, when you give them large doses of normal saline, uh, they tend to become hyperkalemic and there is no potassium in normal saline. So why do they become hyperkalemic? Oh, I'm just uh, guessing. Yes. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't hear what you said. Sorry, can, can I try? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Because as we know, normal saline can cause hyperchloremic acidosis. Yes. As your body is, uh, as a body responds to the acidosis, it will go through the iron-gated channel, the hydrogen and potassium-gated channel. Uh, in response to acidosis, the body will excrete more uh, hydrogen ion rather than potassium. So your body will retain more potassium and it causes hyperkalemia. Absolutely correct. Perfect. That's exactly what will happen. So, you know, in every cell, we have the sodium potassium channel, the sodium potassium pathway. We also have a hydrogen potassium pathway. So the K will go out and the H will go in. And that is why, and remember, I told you about 3000 milliclons of potassium is intracellular. So just giving normal saline in a person who's predisposed to hyperkalemia can end up causing hyperkalemia. That was an excellent answer. So my bottom line is, please try and use balanced crystalloids whenever you want to replace fluids. Okay, 
Now let's go on to the complications of dialysis, something which is very common in the Changi a &E because one of the largest dialysis centers in Singapore is next door to you. That's the CME and KF. So I'll limit myself to access related problems, altered sensorium in a hemodialysis patient and PD peritonitis. So basically, there are only two types of access which a patient will have. It's either a tunneled dialysis catheter or it's an AVF or an AVG. Now, tunnel dialysis catheters and arteriovenous grafts are plastic and hence prone to infection. Why are we in such a big hurry to treat them? Untreated can result in infective endocarditis. What are the commonest organisms? Staph aureus, staph epidermides, and not uncommon for us, gram-negative infections. So please draw a blood culture before giving an antibiotic, and it needs to be at least 5 ml in each bottle. What are we doing which is wrong, and there's no way I can change things? Basically, to say a patient has a CRBI psi or CLAPC, you need a peripheral culture and a culture from the line within 15 minutes of each other. And I, I, I know that there's a lot of resistance from our dialysis nurses to uh, non-renal nurses uh, touching the device. But that is the classic way of demonstrating the presence of a catheter-related bloodstream infection. And when we do the colony count, the one from the catheter is four times as much as the one from the periphery. And that would absolutely seal the diagnosis as a catheter-related bloodstream infection. Now, as far as the antibiotic is concerned, uh, I've realized that anything goes. So, uh, tezosin is a poor choice. So, my choice would be cefazolin plus gentamicin in someone who's not a MRSC skin colonizer. And if he is a MRSC skin colonizer, I would give him vancomycin 20 mg per kilo with one single dose of gentamicin, which would be 2 mg per kilo. After which, once you've drawn the culture, anyway, gentamicin will only have to be given after three days and we can work out whether it needs to be given or it doesn't. Right. Now, fistula bleeds, very common. It's usually due to an upstream venous stenosis. It could be due to an aneurysmal rupture. It could be due to the use of an anticoagulant. Please remember, if the patient doesn't lift the hand, it's very unlikely you will be able to stop the bleed. So it's point compression, raise the hand. This is a venous bleed, remember. Now, on the right, you see this picture with these two fistulae, with one with a pseudo aneurysm. If it is shiny and it has an ulcer on it, I would suggest you call in the vascular surgeon early. This is the type which is going to rupture. And when these rupture, they're not easy to stop. The worst AVGs in my experience to try and stop the bleeding from is the Thomas graft, which is very popular in Australia, which is done in the thigh. It is very, very difficult to stop that bleeding. And I've lost patients in the past trying to stop the bleeding. Okay, very often in the a &E, you have a hemodialysis patient who presents with altered sensorium. There are basically four groups of problems here. One is, could it be uremic encephalopathy? Please remember, uremic encephalopathy only occurs in patients who have not been dialyzed. So a person on dialysis cannot have a uremic encephalopathy unless he decided not to dialyze him for the previous one week at least. The next, dialysis disequilibrium. Dialysis disequilibrium only occurs after the first or second session of dialysis. 
And in Singapore, all dialysis, when we initiate, is done as inpatient. So there's no chance that you're going to see such a patient in the a &E. Intracranial hemorrhage and CVA. Please remember subdural hematomas are 10 to 15 times as common as compared to the normal population. So my first thought, if it's not a metabolic cause like hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, would be an ICH or a CVA. Please consider a CT brain in all patients on maintenance dialysis who come with altered sensorium. Now, the PD patient with a cloudy back. Now, there are three bags on your left, and I've put it purposely so that you understand which one is cloudy and which isn't. The one on the extreme left, which looks relatively clear, is an unused bag. The one in the center is a bag which is cloudy, and the one on the right is a bag after use, and that's why it develops a golden color to it. If you're not sure, whether the bag is cloudy or not, what I would suggest is just put a newspaper under the bag. Every newspaper has the headlines and there's a second set of headlines. If you can't read it through the bag, that is a cloudy bag. I was taught this by an Australian PD nurse and it's always stood the test of time. So when do you diagnose CAPD associated peritonitis? Any patient on PD who has abdominal pain or fever with a cloudy effluent should be considered as having CAPD peritonitis. Uh, there are various criteria for the diagnosis, but when you see them in the a &E, you don't have the benefit of having the white cell count in the PD fluid, or neither do you have the culture. So I would say any PD patient with abdominal pain, fever, or a cloudy effluent should be treated as PD peritonitis. What do our CGH guidelines suggest? Ideally, you should give the antibiotic intraperitoneal, but on the weekends, we don't necessarily have a PD nurse there's nothing wrong in giving an antibiotic IV. Which is the antibiotic I would give IV? I would give cefazolin one gram with gentamicin one mg per kilo. If the person is an MRSC skin carrier, I would give vancomycin plus gentamicin. And obviously by the next day, the PD nurse will be there to do whatever needs to be done. For those those of you who come from SGH, you have been told ad nauseum that giving PD patients IV antibiotics is wrong. There's nothing which is wrong or right. It depends on whether you have a PD nurse available to you or not. A person with hypotension and uh, a cloudy effluent should be considered as a patient with abdominal sepsis and so it's fine to give empiric antibiotics IV. Uh, for those of you who love physics as much as I do, this is one of my heroes, Enrico Fermi, the father of the nuclear bomb. Uh, I'm sure I've confused you with this lecture, but I hope you've been confused at a slightly higher level. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any question you have on any area of renal medicine.